how do I learn Blazor well in 2023? Is it something I should know? As we start into 2023, if you are a C-sharp web developer or an aspiring C-sharp web developer, Blazor is an important tool to learn. Not only is it a great option in the ASP.NET core set of tools, but it's also a technology that Microsoft is investing in heavily. In this video, I'm gonna start out by answering some of the commonly asked questions about Blazor. Then we'll look at the different flavors of Blazor and when to use each. After that, I will outline the order to learn Blazor in. I will go over the steps to take when learning Blazor. I will cover the easiest way to become a Blazor developer. And finally, I will cover some tips and tricks to learning Blazor well. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Tim Corey, and I've been a software developer for over two decades. I'm a self-taught software developer who struggled through all the dead ends, missteps, and conflicting information in my journey to really understand how to become a great software developer. Now, I spend my time trying to make it easier for others. This video is just one of many resources I have to offer. Here on YouTube, I have almost 500 videos around C Sharp, including three full courses for free. I also have other free resources as well as my paid courses on my website, imtimcorey.com. If you want to be prepared for the real world as a software developer, I can help. So let's talk through the frequently asked questions around Blazor. And the first one is, can I get a job with Blazor? This is one that I hear a lot and I definitely understand it. If you're learning a technology, you wanna know, can I be employed with this or is this just something fun to learn? The problem here is that people will go to a job board or they'll look in their local, you know, their local area for Blazor server developer and not find many results. There'll be some, but not many. And they'll say, oh, it must be that no one's using this. And that's kind of a misconception here. And part of the reason why is because Blazor, yes, it's its own application type, but it really is part of ASP.NET Core. And that includes MVC, API, Razor Pages, Blazor Server, Blazor Hybrid. I'm sorry, Blazor WebAssembly. So that those five, those are all encompassing inside of ASP.NET Core. And so when companies advertise, they may say, we want ASP.NET Core web developers. And that can include Blazor or it might not. But even more confusing in some ways, the fact that you can have an MVC site that uses Blazor for some parts of it. You can have a Razor Pages application that has some API mixed in. ASP.NET Core is kind of this, a, this mix of tools that you can use whenever you need a specific tool. And so it's not quite so simple when it comes to advertising that position, besides the fact that companies don't often advertise their jobs very well especially since the job changes, right? Because they may, be, they may be using MVC today. They may say, well, we actually want to go this direction tomorrow. Or they may say, no, we're stuck in this technology for life. And we're not going to you know, deviate at all. So that's kind of confusing. But then even more is the fact that not every company who does web development with C Sharp advertises for ASP.NET Core web developers. They may advertise for .NET developers or C sharp developers. And so it's a little bit more difficult to put your finger on how many companies use Blazor. But one of the things we'll talk about as we go is the fact that when you're learning Blazor, you're primarily learning ASP.NET Core. And so Blazor is a piece of this and it's a really powerful piece that I think you should know. And when it comes to modern development, I think that Blazor is a really good option. But when you're learning this, you're learning an overall ecosystem where you can fit in with other parts that aren't necessarily Blazor only. So can you get a job at Blazor? Absolutely. Is it going to be tricky sometimes to find a job that's only Blazor? Yeah, probably. But that's kind of because that's how it works. With ASP.NET Core, you don't find one specific job necessarily. But yes, there's lots of companies out there that are using Blazor. Now, another part of this is that companies don't just start up 
with new frameworks right away. Now, Blazor is a few years old now. And so that means it is mature. And that's something companies love to see is a mature framework. They don't want to invest in something that's going to be gone next year. So they want to see a mature framework. And that is something Blazor is, but companies don't turn on a dime. If they've invested 10, 15, 20 years into their product, they're probably using .NET Framework, not even .NET Core. Well, Blazor's not in .NET Framework. And so those companies won't use Blazor because they're still kind of stuck in the framework land. And they might not upgrade for a while, or they might be going through an upgrade process now. And if they are going through an upgrade process, Blazor's going to be a really big help to them because of the fact they may be on web forms. And web forms doesn't translate into .NET Core. And so you have the option of choosing Razor Pages or Blazor Server as an option, as a replacement for your web forms. So there's a lot of options, but it is a little bit murky how to figure out how many jobs there are. But here's another thing that I tell people. You don't need tons of jobs. You need one job. So can you get one job? Yeah, yeah, you can. And there's lots of jobs out there. It's just finding how to, how to ask the right questions to find out which companies are using these technologies. All right, number two, should I learn Blazor or MVC? And the answer is yes, learn them both. Now, which one should you learn first? I would say Blazor because that is the more modern framework. MVC is very, very popular in the .NET space because of the fact that it was in .NET framework. And so it has a much longer lifespan and it's something that companies have invested in with .NET framework. Now, some of those companies have upgraded the .NET core and they've just moved over to MVC core. So they're still using MVC. So it's a pretty popular uh, system kind of by default. However, with the new options, there's better options for most scenarios. And I go over this in a course called ASP.NET Core from start to finish, where I actually create the same app five times with API, Razor Pages, MVC, Blazor Server, and Blazor WebAssembly. And so you can see how all five different projects do the same thing and what the benefits and the, the positives and negatives are, what they do well and what they're a little more um, not as not as proficient at or not as good at or not designed to do as well. And so you'll find very quickly that Blazor Server is a much faster way to create a powerful web application than MVC is. So I think that you want to learn Blazor first, but they're both built upon ASP.NET Core, which means that either one you learn, you're going to be learning that underlying core that powers everything. So learning the other one won't be nearly as hard. Number three, is Blazor better than Angular, React, or Vue? No. Now, before you go, aha, I knew it, I want to turn that around. Is Blazor worse than Angular, React, or Vue? No. It's different. And that's the thing that kind of blows people's minds. They want to have a, this one is the best, but that's not how software development works. There is not a, a best because it depends on your situation. And this is where I really push hard on. If you are a C sharp developer, if you are investing in learning C sharp and knowing C sharp in and out and becoming better at C sharp. Why would you then learn an entirely different language to do just your front end if you don't have to? And that's where I think that Blazor can be a better choice than Angular, React, or Vue because you already have the investment in all that C-sharp knowledge. And some people say, well, you know, it's super easy to learn. Yeah, well, kind of not really because there's a difference between knowing how to do the basics and having a deep knowledge in something. And if you say, well, I'm going to learn the basics of C-sharp, I'm going to learn the basics of JavaScript, I'm going to learn the basics of, let's say, React, and now I can build applications, right? Well, you haven't gone into any depth with any of those. And so now what you're left with is 
a, a lack of employability, or even if you can be employed, maybe only at a very junior level. However, if you learn the basics of C-sharp and then say, I'm going to learn C-sharp better while I learn Blazor, all of a sudden you're going deeper in one technology and yet still able to do that full uh, spectrum of backend and front end coding to be a full stack developer. And you still have that rich client side experience with Blazor. And yet you're still going a lot deeper into MB or into C sharp. All of a sudden you can become a mid level or senior developer because of your deep skills in C sharp. And you haven't kind of wasted any energy or just become a, a jack of all trades. You've gone deeply into one technology stack. It also means you can reuse a lot of your tools. So I think as if you're a C sharp developer, there's a lot of benefits to learning Blazor. Now, does that mean that C sharp developers should never learn Angular React or Vue? Not necessarily. No, there's definitely a time and place to learn that and it can add a lot to your skill set, and it can make you even more marketable as a developer. But I don't think that's the first thing you should learn. I think you should learn Blazor instead first. Okay. Number four, will my Blazor skills help me in other areas? Absolutely. Because again, it comes back to it's C sharp. That's what you're doing. You're doing C sharp work. And so it's going to stretch and improve your C sharp skills your object oriented programming skills, your, your skills with, you know, all the stuff that, that makes C sharp complicated sometimes, but also makes you a better developer. Also, it's going to push and grow your skills in ASP.NET core, which means that you will be a better C sharp web developer. You will be better at creating APIs because of the skills you've learned with blazer. So yes, it helps you round out your skills in C sharp. It definitely helps you in other areas besides just the web. And number five, which Blazor should I learn? So far, I've just said Blazor for the most part. And there's more than one Blazor. And I think that we should address the three different Blazors and when you should use each and what each does. So let's do that on the next page. So here, here's the Blazor flavors. The first one is Blazor Server. This is personally my favorite because we'll get into this. It's a server side app that acts like a client side app. If you're not familiar on the web, there's client side languages and server side languages. Angular, React and Vue are client side languages. So what they are, I'm sorry, frameworks, <laughs> they're JavaScript, which is also a client side language, mostly unless you use node, but, um, a client side application lives fully in the browser. Meaning when you run an angular application, all of that JavaScript code, all of it has been downloaded to the client. The client can read all of your source code. It's all visible. Now that can sound scary, but what we do is for client side languages, we don't put really secure stuff in the code. Instead, they talk to APIs and the API, which runs server side has all the secure stuff. So server side languages are languages where we, we write this, the code, but then it gets compiled in the, the user only gets HTML, CSS, and potentially JavaScript. This is a uh, language like MVC and PHP and um, things like that are, are server side where, you know, when you run a C sharp MVC application, you don't see C sharp in the browser. You only see HTML and CSS. The, the benefit there is that you don't give away your source code. You can have secrets you can have direct data access and all the rest of stuff in your code because that never gets sent to the client, only the produced page. The downside is that first of all, the server has to produce all those pages, which can be a little intensive um, versus the client side where the client does all the work. Um, but you have a, a quicker download um, because it's just the re results, not the entire application, 
Whereas client side application, you download the entire application to the client. Um, so there's benefits, there's pros and cons to both. And there's, you know, it depends on which one you choose, which one you are kind of taking on those downsides as well as the upsides. But with Blazor Server, it's got a foot in each world. So it's a server side application, meaning you can have, you can directly talk to a database. You can have secure and sensitive information in the code. You can have it compiled. The client never gets the source code. So it's all good server side stuff and all the benefits there. But then you have that rich client side interactivity, meaning when you um, fill out a form, it can directly populate and not have to refresh the entire page. This is something that any service line that language does. So on a PHP page or an ASP.core MVC page or Razor pages, um, when you fill out a form, it has to go to the server and the server has to say, okay, here's a new resulting entire web page. And it kind of refreshes the whole thing. And yes, you can do some stuff with Ajax, uh, but that's a, in essentially what it does. With client side applications, it's like you're working on a desktop application. It's it's all responsive without having to refresh things. Well, Blazor Server can do that too. So it has the benefits of the server side application with the benefits of the client side application. Now, with anything, there's downsides. And the biggest downside with Blazor Server is it maintains a very tiny connection between the server and the client at all times. The biggest uh, issue there is if you go offline, that it has to try to reconnect. And if it can't reconnect, then you can't use the, the web page. So it, the web page is only, or web application is only available if you are online, which typically isn't a problem, but it is something to know. Everything has downsides. Client side applications have downside, server side applications have downside. So do applications like Blazor Server which live with one foot in each world. But it's not a huge downside compared to choosing a pure server side or a pure client side. So that's Blazor Server. Blazor WebAssembly is a fully client side application, which means that it works just like Angular React Review in the fact that it downloads all your source code to the client and runs your application there, which means it can work offline and it can be a progressive web application. That means that you can install it like a desktop application. You can actually have an icon on your desktop. You can have an icon on your phone that is your icon that launches your web application. It can work offline. It can remember stuff between, between calls, all that stuff. So that's Blazor WebAssembly. The code, just so we're clear, between Blazors is basically the same. So the same source code or almost the same source code will work on Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. The difference is kind of some of the mechanics between the two. And because Blazor WebAssembly is fully client side, it cannot do the server side stuff that Blazor Server can. So it cannot directly access the database. It can't do other sensitive and secure stuff because of the fact that it is has a source code available to the user. Now, it can still do sensitive stuff and talk to a database through an API. And that's how we do that. We just wire up an API, which is ASP.NET Core application as well, which means it's, it's very, very similar, but the API can do all the server side work and the Blazor Web Assembly can do all the client side work. So, in some ways, it kind of has a foot in both worlds that way. It just kind of breaks it out into two applications. The benefit there is that you can also use that API in other circumstances, like for a mobile application or for a desktop application. It's not just to support the Blazor WebAssembly application. So Blazor WebAssembly plus an API is kind of like a, a broken out Blazor server application. The difference is it does not need to have that constant connection. It can work offline. So that's Blazor WebAssembly. And then third, we have a Blazor hybrid app. This is actually not a web application. It's a desktop or mobile app or both 
that's powered by .NET MAUI. .NET MAUI, if you're not familiar, is the uh, multiple application user interface. That's what MAUI stands for. Um, it's the replacement to Xamarin. It's, and this is a brand new system that's still growing. So you can use the same code or most of the same code from Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly when it comes to the actual pages designs and put it into a native desktop or mobile app. It does not have to talk to a web server when you create those applications. It's not just a, a web uh, host that then talks to the server. It runs your web application natively, but your web application is hosted in that app. It's not going to a server does not need to have that connection. So it's a really powerful way to kind of reuse your, your skills in a new way on Mac, on Windows, on iOS, on Android, lots of different options there. So the one note here is Blazor Hybrid is a brand new system that's still growing. It's been out for not quite a year yet as of the recording of this video. So there are changes coming to it because this is where, again, I said that companies love the fact that Blazor Server is mature because it's been out for years. When Blazor Server first came out, it needed some changes. And so it came out in .NET Core 3 or 3.1. And in, I think it was .NET Core 3. But then in .NET 6, it had some major updates because of the things that's kind of missing or lacking. And so there's been some major changes to it in order to kind of get to that mature state where, okay, we've got all the big pieces in place. We're just now tweaking it and making it better and optimizing it. Blazor Hybrid is still in that process of, okay, we need some more things. We need some more pieces to work with. We need to update and fix some, some major sections. So it's still a growing system. It's still very new. It's still something that probably should not be um, your your first choice when it comes to web and desktop. I'm sorry, desktop and mobile. It is mature in the fact that it's built upon Blazor, but it is still an underlying technology of Maui that is being changed over time. Yes, you can use it in production. Yes, it is supported by Microsoft. It's just a matter of how many things is it, does it have, does it have enough things for you? You're going to have to investigate that and look at it. So I would definitely encourage you to look at it. I would definitely encourage you to learn and use Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly because those are definitely mature products. Blazor Hybrid is a newer product, but it is on the road to maturity. All right. So that's the three flavors of Blazor right now. And when you'd use each now, you may have still have a choice uh, or a question about which do I use if I want a web application, Blazor Server or Blazor WebAssembly? Well, it's kind of up to you and your circumstances. Personally, I lean towards Blazor Server unless you can tell me a reason why Blazor WebAssembly is better for a situation. That's the way I look at it. So I start with Blazor Server and say, is there a need for offline access? Is there a need for a progressive web application? If there is, I then move towards Blazor WebAssembly, but otherwise I stick with Blazor Server. So for instance, a suggestion site, which I create a whole course and that course is free here on YouTube. Um, you can also buy it if you want some of the perks about buying it, but that whole course is around building a suggestion site using Blazor Server. That suggestion site, suggestions.imtimcorey.com is what I use for all of my suggestions for future content that runs on Blazor server. And it runs quite well. So that I didn't need to have offline access for that. I need for it to be a progressive web application. You really don't need to have something installed on your computer to add suggestions to my site. I think that's just a web application is all you need, but I like some of the interactivity that gave me that that rich client side uh, stuff that it gave me with the um, Blazor server. So it's up to you which one you choose. You have to choose the right one for your project. There's no uh, right one without looking at your specific project. So those are the three flavors. Let's talk now about the learning order. And this learning order 
It's one that people want to just jump right into Blazor Server. Give me the intro of Blazor Server. Give me, you know, which I have this on YouTube. Um, give me the, give me started and let's go with Blazor. It's not quite that simple. So let's talk through the order and you may know some of this already and that's great. Just figure out where you are in this order and make sure you haven't skipped anything. So the very first thing, you gotta learn C-sharp. Don't start learning C-sharp by learning Blazor. That's the absolute wrong place to start because Blazor uses advanced C-sharp object-oriented programming and advanced C-sharp coding. So you need to know that. It also uses HTML and CSS. So you probably should need to know that. And it actually can interact really well with JavaScript. You might need to know that as well, or at least the basics of that for sure. So now you've got four different languages that you need to know just when you get started for Blazor. If you already know those, then getting started with Blazor is just adding one more piece on top. If you don't know any of those, you've got to learn five different things all at once. And that's going to be discouraging. And you're also going to have a hard time becoming proficient in anything. You'll have a lot of gaps in your education. So learn C Sharp well first. Then learn web development. And no, I don't mean Angular React Review. I don't mean ASP.NET Core. I mean web development. I mean HTML. CSS and JavaScript. Learn those. Again, not JavaScript frameworks, not JavaScript plugins, not JavaScript, uh, f you know, systems or, or packages. Learn the actual code. So HTML and by the way, HTML5, CSS, CSS3, and modern JavaScript. Learn those next. After that, learn ASP.NET Core. This again, like I said, is the foundation for all of the, the web projects in C Sharp. So it's going to be the same foundation for all five projects. So you should learn this foundation first. Then learn Blazor Server. The reason why is I have found this is the one that fits the most scenarios, the easiest. It is a really fast way to create an interactive website that can capture information, that can display information, that can manipulate information, all the things a web application needs to do very, very quickly. And it's usually the, the best way to get the most out of your time. You can get the fastest results with the littlest at least effort using Blazor Server. So I learned that first. But next up, do learn Blazor WebAssembly. You want to have that additional tool in the toolbox. You want to be able to say, hey, you know what? This isn't the best fit for Blazor Server. We're going to have some connectivity issues. We want to be able to work offline. Blazor WebAssembly is a great option for that. So that's a great tool to build off of. One quick note here that some people, I probably should have put in the FAQs, but some people um, question, well, is Blazor Server going to go away? because it's, you know, just like Silverlight. And I have a whole video on, no, it's not. But uh, in fact, what most people think about Silverlight is wrong. And I have a whole video on that. But Blazor WebAssembly is built upon WebAssembly, which is not a Microsoft thing. It's an industry standard. Blazor Server is built upon the connection part. That's the big, you know, uh, fancy secret sauce in there. The connection part is signal R, but what is signal R? It's actually just a, a wrapper around web standard connectivity, uh, web sockets and long polling and some other types of, again, industry standard ways of connecting. It just makes things easier with signal R. So these things are all web standard ways of doing things. And then they build on top of that using C sharp and do it in open source system. So this is open source technology built upon web standards. That's a far sight different than Silverlight. It's a far sight different than saying Microsoft has full control over this. So just note that these are rock solid technologies and 
their web standard and web compliant. Okay, so next up, these are the things that you can kind of learn in any order, but they're, they'll all be beneficial to learning these. Git, you should learn source control, specifically Git. And I have a whole video on getting started with Git in 2023 um, that you should check out if you've not yet learned Git. Docker, uh, same thing. You need to know Docker in 2023. Docker is a really important technology. And yes, there are um, ways of not using Docker itself, like Docker desktop, but you're still using containers. And so you should know about containers. You should know how to use them. And Docker is the easiest way of using containers, especially locally. So learn about Docker. Um, some people have the question, well, you know, there's also now serverless. So therefore I shouldn't need to know about Docker. That's a misconception. Learn Docker. Serverless is something else, and you still should know Docker and containers. Uh, Azure. You should know a cloud platform. I recommend Azure um, for a number of reasons. One of the biggest one, the biggest reason why I recommend Azure is because of the number of horror stories I have heard from AWS people, where they they try to learn AWS and which is Amazon Web Services, by the way. Um, and that's kind of a big player in the market. And they've they've learned it and they've gone through tutorials and all of a sudden they get a $10,000 bill. And that's confusing, that's frustrating, and that's scary to think that that could come. And it's a lot more difficult to track expenses in AWS. It's a lot more difficult to manage the systems. And Azure has put some things in place that make it a lot easier. It still can be confusing to work in the cloud the first time. However, I've got a whole course in Azure, and that's one of the big things we concentrate on are all the tools that you can put in place to make sure that you protect yourself and that you spend less than what you would in other ways, meaning less than you would spend on a regular web host, less than you would spend on a, uh, a normal database or whatever, and how to make sure you monitor that budget, how to make sure that when you're testing things that you fully get rid of anything that's gonna charge you, how to make sure that you, you know, block anything that could be too expensive and so on. So I have found that Azure is a safer environment, especially for learning. So that's what I recommend, but learning a cloud provider is important when learning the web. And then uh, Bootstrap, because Blazor Server, Blazor Assembly, the templates that are not the blank templates use Bootstrap as their structure for um, creating web applications. They're their way of shortcutting a lot of that work. And if you bring in the Microsoft identity stuff, well, that also uses Bootstrap. So if you use anything in .NET Core, MVC or Razor Pages, they also use Bootstrap and Bootstrap 5, by the way. So I recommend learning it. Now, do you have to use Bootstrap? No, you do not. You can rip it out. You can use the blank templates for Blazor. Um, and that will give you basically no frameworks, no systems. You're on your own to figure out how to make everything work and write your own CSS. You can do that, but I recommend make your life easier. Learn Bootstrap. Now, one of the things you will not notice in this list, and it may be glaringly obvious. You may not, you may have forgotten about it already. Blazor Hybrid isn't in this list, and that's by intent. I thought about it. I thought about saying, well, let's add one more. Um, yes, after all of this, I recommend using learning Blazor Hybrid, but it's not something I'd recommend before learning all of this. Also, Blazor Hybrid is not quite the same thing as a web application. It's a desktop slash mobile application, and there's a whole lot more to learn there, meaning, okay, you've built the application, but how do you deploy it? How do you deal with the app stores? How do you deal with, you know, the certificates and all the rest of the stuff you have to do? There's a lot of stuff to learn in those categories. So what I did instead was I focused on the web portion of this, which is Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. The cool thing is that if you learn all of this, then learning Blazor Hybrid is just a matter of adding the mobile slash desktop deployment scenario stuff and the few differences that hybrid brings versus other blazers. So 
you've made your life a whole lot easier when doing that if you go this route first. So that's my recommendation for the learning order. That's my recommendation for, for what steps to take. Yes, this is a lot of stuff. This is a lot of stuff to learn. And if you're just starting off and you said, well, I want to learn Blazor, I would start with C-sharp. Please trust me on this one. I have seen people start in the middle and that's what you're doing. You're starting in the middle. And if you start in the middle, it makes it so much harder to actually be an effective developer because you don't have that good foundation. So start at the beginning, even though it might not be exactly what you want to do right now. You might want to do the fun, cool Blazor server stuff or Blazor WebAssembly stuff. Get there eventually. Don't skip steps. So with that, um, let's get into the learning steps, the, the steps to take. Um, this is something that, that I do in each of these videos. I want to make sure that you understand the process because it's a little different for different technologies, but there should be a rhythm to how you learn. So first thing, learn a small topic or item. Don't bite off huge chunks. Don't say, today I'm gonna learn object-oriented programming. That's way too big. Learn about class instantiation instead, just that. Learn why you instantiate classes, how instantiation works, what it means. That's still quite a bit to grasp and it's quite a bit that you should probably practice. And speaking of which, practice the basics. So when you learn a small topic or item, practice that. Do not move on. Do not skip to the next small topic or item. Practice the basics and then practice the edge cases. So when you are practicing, you need to first just recreate what you saw. Can I do that? Does it work for me? Is there something different that I need to do? Because sometimes things will have changed. I just worked with a customer who um, asked a question because in the video, I used the Microsoft command prompt. And when he was doing it, it was the Microsoft terminal. And there was tiny little differences in the two. Well, when you practice, you figure those things out. And at first, it may be frustrating because you're like, it's not exactly the same. That's okay. Learn how to adjust, learn how to figure out the differences figure it out so that you know how to actually use it in the real world. And then that's the basics. But then try to expand, try to play the options, try to play with the different pieces of it and see, hey, how does this interact with something else? Or how does this interact with what I learned in the last lesson? Or how do I add these features or, or tweak this? What does this do? And just try stuff. It's okay to break stuff and practice. If you're practicing in a practice environment, not in production, but if you're practicing in a practice environment, you can break anything you want. The worst case, you start over. No big deal. You do not want to do that or have to do that when you are actually dependent on your code working. So break stuff. Try it out. Figure out what works, what doesn't work, and understand better how to use what you just learned. And only then do you repeat. So that's the cycle. Do that over and over and over again. Don't skip steps two and three. It's very important. This is what separates people who get it from those who don't, is steps two and three. I used to teach a class and it was a 16 week class where I would teach C Sharp from, from start. So students would walk in knowing nothing about C Sharp. I would teach them for 16 weeks. And one of the things I almost always told the class in week one was practice. Here's how you practice, practice this. Every week, I want you to practice what you just learned. And I would tell them, listen, if you don't practice, you're gonna be fine or think you're fine until about week five. And then week five, you're gonna come to me and say, I am so far underwater, I don't know what to do. And I'm gonna ask, did you practice? And you're gonna tell me, no, I didn't really practice. I was, you know, I was busy. I was, I thought I had it. I, I, I was pretty sure I understood it, but now I realize I don't. And that realization, it's kind of, it's kind of too late at that point. You've got to go back and start over and start practicing. And so those students would have to play catch up. 
where they have to practice five weeks worth of work in one because they have to keep going, you know, for week six, week seven, and so on. So you have to catch up by practicing everything that you thought you knew, but you really didn't. So practice, practice, practice. It's super important. It's the number one thing I recommend because this is what separates people from thinking they want to be a developer, trying to be a developer to actually becoming a developer is that practice. Okay, so let's talk about the easy path and then we'll get into the tips and tricks. So the easy path, this is, in case you didn't know, I sell courses. Now, I wanna be clear here. I have almost 500 free videos on YouTube. I have lots of free content and you can learn from that content and you do not have to pay a dime. So I would encourage you, if you're like, man, I gotta really scrimp and save to try and maybe afford one course, don't do it. <laughs> go the easy, go the, the route that takes you more time. It's gonna make, take a little more effort and a little more planning and a little more um, intentionality, but you can definitely do it by learning through free content, a lot of which I provide. But if you want the easy path, which is here, I'll lay it out step by step. I will teach you step by step. I'll teach you in order that makes sense. I will teach you exactly what you need to know for the real world. And all of that content will build upon the previous content that you learned. It'll be a continual education, not a, a patchwork education. If you want that, then this is the easy path. And yes, it does cost something. And all the proceeds from that, we use those to help fund more free content, more free stuff. In fact, we, um, we had a bit of an uptick last year and we are planning next week, we're going to get together and plan how we can provide more content to the community. I can't wait. So your money does go fund more free stuff. So let's talk through the, the easy path. Number one, the C-Sharp Master Course. This is the place to start. If you are just starting with C-Sharp, if you have no clue what C-Sharp is, but you know you want to be a C-Sharp developer, or you think you might want to, C-Sharp Master Course, the place to start. It starts you off from, let's install Visual Studio, and let's talk about what C-Sharp even is, all the way through debugging and object-oriented programming and user interfaces and data access from, I, I think it was five, 10, 12 different database types, a lot. Um, we, we cover, we build two full practice applications to see how to put what we've learned together, put those pieces together into a working application. So you actually practice what you learn, not only using the homework, which is practice just that last lesson, but also let's practice the, the last few sections by building a comprehensive application. It really is designed to not just teach you the, the theory or the head knowledge about C-sharp, but to teach you the real world C-sharp that will allow you to walk into a job and start doing the work. So that's the C-sharp master course. Next up is the web development master course. This is the same thing, but for the web. This is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it's designed to teach you everything you need to know to have a great foundation in web development. It's, it is the best course I could put out on web development. We go through basics of HTML and advanced HTML, basics of C, uh, CSS, again, CSS3, and also the advanced CSS. We go through the basics of JavaScript and advanced JavaScript. We work through um, how to use the browser tools. We work through how to use VS Code. We talk through and work through how to make an accessible website. We talk through SEO. We create two full practice sites using what we've learned. We go over web tools. This course covers all the foundational stuff you need to really be a web developer. It answers questions that some of people don't even realize they have. People often think, oh, well, HTML is easy. Yeah, in a lot of ways it is, but there's a lot of depth there that you can get by without knowing if you don't care about SEO, if you don't care about accessibility, if you don't care about having a well-maintained site, if you don't care about making a modern web application. So yeah, you can get by, but it's not gonna be 
a good thing. You're going to find out you're actually causing some problems down the road. So the web development master course is the next step. After that, ASP.NET Core from start to finish. This is that course where I introduce all five project types in ASP.NET Core. And then I show you how to build the same full CRUD web application with all five. We do the like same application. It's, uh, it's a little application. It's not anything flashy. We don't do uh, user interface stuff as much. Um, that's more web development master course. But instead you focus on how do I get data to the page, you know, read, how do I create data? How do I update data? How do I delete data? And how I do with each of the five types so I can see what the differences are. We then c compare and contrast each and talk through which scenarios work best for which project types and how to choose which one is right for your project and your situation. So it's a really good in-depth look at ASP.NET Core as a whole, as a foundation. After that, there's two I recommend that are smaller courses. They're also cheaper, um, but .NET Core Dependency Injection and .NET Core App Settings, both from start to finish. And what these are, are they go in depth into a major piece of .NET Core and specifically something that both, both are used in ASP.NET Core. So dependency injection, not just how to use the basics of it, but how to go well into the advanced stuff of it, how to um, create factories and how to um, have, you know, passing information into a construction of a dependency and how to have multiple dependencies that use the same interface and lots of other cool stuff there. In app settings, people often don't realize that App settings is not the .json file in your application. It's not just one file. It's actually five different locations that you can store settings. And so we talk through all five different or setting, setting locations, including secrets.json. If you're not using secrets.json, you should be. But then also how to add to app settings, how to add new places to look, including Azure Key Vault and a web applications settings and so on. And so we talk through how to use that effectively, because if you don't know how to use these in depth, if you don't know how to use them effectively, then you've got this great tool that you're using 10% of. I often see people bring in additional dependencies because they say, well, this third party tool does this. And I'd say that's already built in. So you just took an external dependency that's going to hold you back potentially from upgrades and other things because you didn't know how to use the tool you already had. So learn to use a tool you already have really, really well. Next up, this is where Blazor Server from start to finish comes in. This is, we've got a full course on this. It goes in depth in a lot of different parts of Blazor Server. I did just update it for .NET 6 and .NET 7 and some of the, the new stuff that that came out. And this really goes into all the different features that Blazor Server does and really Blazor in general and how it works and how to set up and configure it and change it and, and all the rest of the stuff that um, really can make you into a great Blazor Server developer. After that, I would recommend, this is kind of an optional one, but I'd highly recommend Azure from start to finish. One of the things that people tell me is, well, the cloud is so expensive. And I can tell you that it can be, it absolutely can be, but the cloud can also be a much, much cheaper option. It can also be a much, much safer option and a much, much more performant option. So you have the ability to take advantage of the cloud and make it your best place to host your content if you know how to use it well, if you know how to protect yourself, if you know how to manage it well. So that course goes into all of that. It really hyper-focuses on making sure that you spend as little as possible. So that's a great course to get into. And then finally, building a suggestion site app. This is the full course, it's on YouTube. So all the videos are on YouTube, there's a playlist. If you go to this channel's playlists, you'll see the playlist there for the suggestion site app. 
You can watch the whole thing on YouTube for free. It's sponsored by MongoDB. That's why it's there for free. Um, they paid to have it be there for free. It's where we build the suggestion site, the actual site that's running. We build that using Blazor Server, using MongoDB as a database type, and we build the entire application. We, we talk through and build a nice user interface. We work through how to do some of those HTML things that are important, the CSS things that are important, and set up our own design and system and work with Bootstrap and how to do that effectively. And we, we talk through how to build a full uh, CRUD access with MongoDB and how to do that well, and how to um, manage your data so that's efficient performance and all the rest, how to do caching and so on. So we do a lot of stuff in that, that full site app. The, the intent is to show you how to build a practice application that puts together all the pieces you've learned previously. Now, in this case, it's an actual application as well because I was already building it. However, this is the kind of thing you can do for practice so that if you mess it up, no big deal. And you can follow along as I do this and have your own site like it, where you can then tweak it and play with it instead of trying to build everything from scratch. But this is a definite um, must do at some point is something like this, where you're building a full application that's not going to be your actual application. Now I did it as my actual application because I've done this multiple times as practice applications. But I want to show you how to build practice applications. They're full applications so that you get that habit and that, that rhythm of how an actual full application gets built. That's something that I hear a lot of people say is, you know, I really know C Sharp well, but I've never built a full application or I wouldn't know how to build a full application. Well, that's because you're not practicing all the pieces. Okay. So you need to practice individual pieces, but then you need to practice putting them together. And that's where these build a full application courses. I got multiple of them. This is where they come into play because they can help you see how to build and practice putting together all the pieces to build a full application. So that's the easy path. There's a lot here. I don't expect you to then just say, okay, I've got to go through all of those. And if you do, it sounds like you probably need the all access pass because it's going to be a whole lot cheaper. But I expect that you're somewhere on this, this list where maybe you say, you know what? I know C Sharp pretty well. Um, I, I know ASP.NET Core pretty well. I know dependency injection and app settings pretty well, but I don't really know web development yet. Or I've kind of learned it on my own and piece it together and it has some gaps. So I need to do that, step two. But then I can skip down to step six. And that's fine. Use this list as it works best for you. I can't know what your specific circumstances are, but this is the comprehensive list of start to finish what will turn you into a great Blazor Server developer. And you need to figure out what things on this list you need to do. And I'd recommend doing them in this order. All right, so let's talk through some tips and tricks. So the first one, this is a hard coded one. I said it before, I won't belabor it too much, but practice is an extra. It's essential. If you don't practice, and if you don't practice enough, what's gonna happen is you're gonna think you know something until it comes time to actually use it. And then you're going to get into trouble. You're not gonna know how to do it. So, Practice is an extra, it's essential. Number two, don't skip the easy stuff. And I put that in quotes because it's not actually that easy. You need to know how to do the more in-depth stuff, but don't skip the easy stuff like HTML. HTML, if you don't know, and you should, HTML is about building the structure of your web application. It's designed to be developed in order in a way that it's like building the, the frame of a building. If you don't build the structure right, you can make the walls look as pretty as you want. It's not built right, okay? So you need to make sure that you build your structure correctly. So don't skip out on HTML and say, well, it's just divs and H tags. It's much, much more than that. Stick to the plan and learn order. I know it is 
it is tempting to just learn the flashy stuff. Learn the stuff that you can actually see results on right away, the stuff that you can show off and say, hey, I got this cool web application that you know does these things. And you can follow tutorials and get a working Blazor server application or Blazor WebAssembly application that does stuff that is really cool. And you could think that you have made progress. The problem is that you've built it on a black box. A black box is something where you don't know what's going on inside. And that's kind of how you'll look at your web application. Like, I know it works, but I don't know why it works. And that's a super scary place to be because at some point it is going to break. And when it does, you will have no clue why. And at that point, you will have to learn everything you need to know in order to fix it, which may be a significant portion of the learning path I just showed you which is hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of content. Well, you don't want to do that when production is broken. Okay. So if you stick to the plan and learn in order, it won't be a black box. You'll understand the pieces that go into it. These you build on the foundation. And so if you have a good foundation and you put good pieces on top of foundation, and then you start learning and using Blazor, where you have this solid foundation underneath that allows you to understand what's going on, then when things break, you'll have much more confidence in your development skills, in your ability to fix it and to make it work. So stick to the plan, learn in order. It'll be much better for you. You'll have much better success. You'll have a much better outcome. Please just stick to the plan. Number four, pace yourself. When you're enthusiastic, you want to sprint. Don't sprint. This is a marathon. Take your time. Put it on the schedule. Say, I'm going to practice four and pick a reasonable time. Two hours, one hour, twice a week, whatever. Pick some time. Put it on the calendar for every week. And so you say, I'm going to practice Saturday morning at 8 a.m. for two hours every week. And you know what? Stuff's going to happen. Stuff's going to happen where you're not going to be available 8 a.m. On, on one Saturday. Don't despair. Don't give up. Don't then use that as an excuse to put off the next Saturdays. Instead, move it. Put it on a calendar and say, well, then I'm going to reschedule this for Sunday at 8 p.m. Or I'm going to reschedule this for Monday. Whatever it's going to be, reschedule. And if you have to, you have to skip. That's it happens sometimes, but then use that as extra motivation to make sure you make the next one. So pace yourself. Don't go all in the first week. Don't just block off an entire week and do nothing but study. That's a sprint and it will burn you out. Pace yourself. Number five, evaluate your progress and continually improve. You want to continually look at how you're doing how you're learning and figure out how you can make things better, but also look at this as a way to encourage yourself. Maybe get a little journal and start where every day that you study, you write the date and a brief synopsis of what you learned. If you do that, then when you look back over the last three months, you'll flip through multiple pages. You'll see all the progress you've made. Instead of just looking at your your to-do list of all things to learn and seeing how far and how large that is, you'll see how far you've come and how much you've learned. That will continue to encourage you, but you can also look at that and say, hey, if I made these changes, I could learn a little better. I could have a little better success and have even more pages done by the time we hit the next section, okay? So that's how you continually progress and continually improve. All right, so that's it for learning Blazor in 2023. I hope it's helpful. Uh, leave a comment down below what your thoughts are. Thanks for watching. As always, I am Tim Corey.